Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. You know, we find ourselves in an interesting time, deeply divided as a community and as a nation in our opinions and what we accept as facts. The economic disparities have widened. The once comfortably well-off middle class is virtually non-existent. And most of us struggle with the roof over our head. Either we can't afford to purchase a house, then can't find rental that we can afford, or get evicted by our landlord so the property can be turned into a short-term vacation rental, and then we can't find anywhere else to live in our vanishing housing market. Or we had the good fortune to be able to purchase a home 20 years ago or so, when the prices weren't so out of control, but are on a fixed income And as the cost of necessities such as food and health care, utilities and property taxes increase, and our strength and stamina decrease, the deferred maintenance of our homes is catching up with us. In the midst of those economic pressures, it's sometimes difficult to focus on the difficulties faced by those with even less. My guest today is one of the people working tirelessly on Raising the Level of the Water, Brookings Core Response Executive Director, Diana Ku almost said it, Carter. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Diana. Hey. Thanks. So lots and lots to talk about. Oh, yeah. First, the name change. Let's just get that out of yeah, the way. I, Used to be Cooper, now Carter. I figure... It's a know, much better name, right? We do Carter. sometimes talk about... I, I was thinking we do sometimes talk about like my health stuff that's going on, mm-hmm. and we kind of catch up with that. Mm-hmm. So. And then there's a lot of people out there that know me and know what I'm doing and may not recognize, uh, even though it's such a slight change, may not recognize me with a different last name. So I figure this is probably a good way to rip off the Band-Aid for everyone. But yeah, so uh, a lot of a lot of folks who know me as Diana Cooper will now start seeing Carter. Um, I did. We got a divorce and... uh, you know, and that's your maiden yeah, name, Carter. Uh, yep, and yeah. I went back to my maiden name. So yeah. we're it's you know very amicable, and we're I'm really happy that we're we're both moving forward and doing well. So good, excellent, yeah. excellent. So Diana Cooper Carter, Cooper Carter, Cooper yeah. Carter. <laughs> yeah, you are going to have such a hard time with that. I know. I know. I really am. Yeah, I really am. It's like Diana Cooper as the name. Even I've though been I've been saying. preparing you for months, I, know, I feel but like it's the name that rolls off I my know. tongue. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's hard. I to know. I I it, I changed it so long ago. Now that I'm like, how do I? It's like getting on a moving train. I'm like, how do I get back on this? Yeah. How do I change everything? Yeah, well, I, pain. I've told you this before, but I've I've been married four times. on my fourth marriage. Yeah. I never changed my name. That's so smart. I think I just had an intuition that my chooser was pretty broken <laughs> and I was probably going to need my maiden name. And there was no point you know, in going back say, and forth. They say if you get like a tattoo with someone's name on it or something, that's usually a death sentence or I was so close. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Wow. That. <laughs> I love it. So there is a ton of stuff yeah. going on with your organization. And you've got several different projects in the works. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw your posting of a data entry position. Data specialist. Yes, mm-hmm. on Facebook. So how that's many exciting. staff do you actually have now? This will be our 11th staff person wow. and we we foresee several positions this year opening up but um, data specialist this is one of the few positions that we're hiring for that's not any direct service so this person's really going to be um, doing just I mean I hope they love computers because that's that's uh, primary right. part of the job yeah right. so some people really do oh yeah I they, actually they really do too um, Cindy and I both are pretty tech savvy um, a lot of people are, are learning quite a bit about it, mm-hmm. but Cindy and I are pretty tech savvy, so I'm, I'm excited to get another person in because usually her and I are kind of IT, mostly her now because she's, right. you know, they can just come grab her. So it'll be nice to have a third person that we can come grab and troubleshoot things. Absolutely. Because how I usually fix things is I go up and I stand there and they fix themselves. So I'm very effective and... As Some that of my us wish that we IT. could have you live with I us. I know. <laughs> I think the computers just act right when I'm nearby. But it, it um, is just that energy. I don't know what to say. Yeah. 
<laughs> but sometimes when stuff really goes sideways, you know, we got to call out the Calvary. Yeah. So. Yeah. Whoever they are. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I hope you have them in your back pocket, Google? too. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, there are several projects that we've been talking about over the over the weeks that involve real estate acquisitions. Yeah. Which I find so bizarre. I know. It seems like every time I'm talking to you, there's something new. And, uh, you know, several people have mentioned to me that they just aren't able to keep up with everything. And I totally get it. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're having a hard time keeping up. Yeah. There's. Well, <laughs> I know what all the projects are, but... Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of tasks, a lot of moving parts, um, yep. and a lot of kind of higher level executive decisions that have to be made. And so, did you um, ever foresee this for no, yourself? Isn't no. isn't it bizarre? I thought, it? yeah, <laughs> I thought maybe we'd be providing some kind of healthcare navigation stuff to seniors, people with disabilities, maybe you know, working with people who are without housing and all of that, but. That's kind of where I primarily saw. I I didn't expect we would own any of the projects like this. Mm -hmm. I really thought we would kind of we would just be sort of a uh, you know support services team mm -hmm. for a lot of agencies. But you know that's that's kind of what happens in an area like this where there's a lot of gaps. Is um, you really have to work together to start closing those gaps, and some you know all the agencies need to pick up what they can do and and. It's hard because we try not to step on each other's toes, but there's always overlap and there should be overlap sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's important to have to have that. Um, we so. also lost a couple of organizations. We have. And um, yeah, there's been a couple and, you know, they're, they're still a lot of agencies are still working through their processes. So I won't name them or anything, but there's certainly we're losing some some long term you know, one's been here for 30 years. Another one's been here, I think, at least a decade. Um, and then another one was fairly new and, and small. And so they, they tried to get a running start at it. But it was, you know, it's hard. It's hard to. But that also really leaves gaps. Oh, totally. You know, when you Even if they're not providing a lot of services, which they were providing a, a wide variety. I mean, um, one of them was certainly providing a, a critical service in our community. But um, even if they aren't, it still leaves gaps because it's geographically, it's, you know, even if there's only, you know, five people in a city and it loses its agency, that's still five people that, and the potential of others that could need that. Right. So it, it leaves gaps. Um, you know, we were we were already trying to figure out how to gear up to cover those communities as well to support those agencies. Um, so now it's really kind of a lot of regrouping to figure out how we can expand the services we have down here up there so so what what can you talk about in terms of the real estate and the projects and yeah what, what i can i yeah. definitely go into a lot of detail on the ones that we already have mm -hmm. um i can you know briefly go over the ones that we're expecting and then a few that are kind of in the queue that mm -hmm. uh you know the next few days are really going to bring out a lot of answers so every day is a Every day is very interesting. It is, isn't it? Um, so the first one is our. Um, well, I'll just I'll use their project names because I think the locations um, are a little bit difficult right now to mm -hmm. to talk about. But the the first one is the project Turnkey, which is called Pineview Cottage. Mm -hmm. So that is a five bedroom house um, that'll have staffing on site and will have really a quite a, a variety of services and case management offered. You know, it's it's downtown. It's um, it's actually in a really good location. There's not a lot of places right next to it, and so that's really helpful. But it's a beautiful spot. I mean, I just watching that place transform over the last, it, even just the last four or five months has been really amazing to see. And I am so like, you know, I I so did not expect to be doing this that. They ask me stuff like, well, you know, what kind of chandelier do you want here? And I'm like, I have whatever you think, <laughs> exactly. look, whatever's the easiest to install and looks good. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I think there was a couple weeks there where Adam was trying to get me to pick a paint color. And he was like, oh, you know, there's a really great color I used on my house. Go drive by that. I never went and looked. <laughs> and so I, then one day they got all the painting done on the house and I drove up and, oh my God, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's this beautiful, like, forest green, like a pine green. Yeah. So it really it really fits um, its name there. So 
in Pineview is actually a nod to myself because there were some people that said, you know, oh, you should name it uh, Cooper House, which really glad I didn't do that, obviously. Yeah. But um, but also that just seems a little egotistical mm-hmm. to me. <laughs> yeah. But there are pine trees everywhere around there because that's, you know, Pacific Northwest. That's yep. where we are. Yep. And so um, I named it Pineview Cottage because I was born on Pine Street here. So. Oh. So it's a little nod, a subtle nod oh, to like and my that. family. And then, um, so that's that's going to be transitional housing. We we actually, uh, that'll be open July 1st, but we're going to be using that in the interim for gearing up our transitional. So there will be clients in there very soon. Could be could be within two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know all, great. I've been carrying this torch for Project Turnkey since October of 2020 when I sat at the first meeting and state officials are there and everybody in the county is there. And we talked about it for an hour. And towards the end of the hour, you know, the question really was hanging in the air. Who's going to take this project? And it's just nobody. And I understand why. I totally understand why. And I just couldn't. I just couldn't let that opportunity go. I, you know, we had to try. So we did. And there was a lot of kerfluffle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. That first attempt was... Uh, oh, the first one was, gosh. Yeah. A lot. Um, you know, there was, there was certainly some battle with the city. The second one was really a battle with this kind of small pocket of the community that really is struggling with the idea of these services. Mm-hmm. So it's been quite a battle, mm-hmm. but I also think that I've I've seen such a tremendous support come out. I mean, the work that we're doing as we're doing this, as we're building, um, you know, Pineview Cottage to what we want it to be and, and, you know, how we want to present it to the community and the world. As we're doing that, we're also doing our other services on the side. And that has instilled a lot of confidence in the community that we've noticed. Mm -hmm. The clients, the community members, leadership, um, even law enforcement, we have seen some really positive responses. Right. So... I think that um, maybe, maybe we're changing the stigma just just for a few folks. No, but, I think that's mm-hmm. I think that's important. You know, if if people can see that things are not just spiraling right. out of it's control, it's not what people think, right? And honestly, um, I get wrapped up in that sometimes. Just opening the shelter every year because we do winter shelter every year, and I always just the worst case scenarios always run through my mind. And what, you know, the rhetoric that people say runs through my mind and all those things. And it's just never like that. It's, it's, I mean. You've done winter some of the shelter stories. Mm-hmm. For, for what, two years? Three years. Three years. Yeah, this was our third year. The first year was really more related to COVID. Mm-hmm. The second year uh, was just winter shelter. And that, and then this, this last year was winter shelter um, that just got extended. So we're going to be doing a little oh, bit because more. it was supposed to close was, yeah it, and it actually we already closed to april 1st and of course the state um they're fashionably late um <laughs> sent us a notice that there was an extension when we wow. already had closed most of the rooms so we couldn't just turn right around and, right. and restart because we had already kind of gotten a lot of people transitioned to where they needed to be so which is great oh it was wonderful yeah yeah um in fact i'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later but yeah, so we we kind of said, okay, we're going to take a couple weeks and regroup, mm-hmm. and we're going to open up um, Pineview early, um, great earlier than we right. had intended because we're ready. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I'm I'm really excited about that. So that's that is one major um, project for sure, and the first um, piece of real estate that we actually owned. So so the second one is our office. This one we also owned. We closed escrow at the beginning of the month and you got our first did. rent payment That's because there's a tenant. Right. So that was exciting because we closed escrow. And then like maybe just a few hours later, I got a call from the tenant that's in there and said, where do you want the rent check? And I was like, oh, right, because we're your landlord right now. Wow. So that was really cool. Um, it, you know, it's going to be short term because they're, they're going to be moving out so we can move in and, and open our drop-in space there. Mm-hmm. But um, was that's a whole different landscape for you. Oh, it's I mean, wow. The the, it's not like you're going to see the big boom in services like we did in 2023. But there are some things that we haven't been able to do and provide that we'll now be able to do. And because of the space that we're in right now, we really have to be 
mindful and respectful of of the landlord's rules and the other businesses around. Um, but there's a few services that, you know, ideally, I mean, they, they wouldn't really impact um, the neighbors. But I think that in general, I think the landlord is just hasn't wanted that to happen in our space we're in now. So we'll be able to, um, we talked with HIV Alliance about a needle exchange program. Um, it's funny, all these years, we've, there's been so many rumors about us, you know, handing out needles. And I've had to quell those rumors. But part of what I'm trying to explain when I'm quelling that is not that we're not doing it because that's a terrible program. We're not doing it because we, we just aren't allowed to where we're at. But that's an incredible program. And um, it's to make sure that people are not Getting are not sick. sharing needles and it's right and getting it, it sick prevents and, the spread of disease right yeah exactly and um i mean contrary to what people think it does not encourage um, substance use what encourages substance use is substance use so uh you know people aren't gonna get clean because they don't have a clean needle no they're gonna use a dirty needle so exactly we know that get ill so yeah so there's a few things that we're looking forward to being able to provide. We're looking at bringing a shower trailer on site to supplement St. Timothy showers. Oh, nice. You know, they're open Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we could potentially do Tuesday, Thursday in our office mm -hmm. and then do Monday, Wednesday, halftime Gold Beach and Port Orford to cover the whole county. And then wow. Friday's cleaning day. So that, uh -huh. that would be shut down. Right. So we're looking at um, what, what can we bring on site? We were talking about um, the dental van that comes to St. Tim's. Mm -hmm. Potentially having it come out there for a couple of hours, maybe a morning at St. Tim's and then the afternoon with us. That'd be great. Um, we, we've reached out to KCI Institute with OHSU to talk about their vision um, van, that, that their eye van that goes down, travels around. Nice. I know that there's been a lot of expanded coverage for eye, you know, glasses and exams and things like that for OHP. So... Hopefully, a lot of that is is mitigated that need. But if they are still going out and about, we we'd like to catch them because we still have uninsured people. Even though we also now are sisters and can sign people up for insurance, hmm. so that's a new development. As well. well, there's no vision insurance for those Medicare who are on Medicare. Correct. Yeah. Which the this which is this like, van would be kidding? fantastic for that. And so yeah. what we would do is do screenings mm -hmm. um, and get a list of people who are high priority. So when the van cool. comes, they're we we're getting those folks in. Great. So yeah, Excellent. that that's a Excellent. huge possibility. Yes. Wow. Um. So so that's kind of our office space. It's not much bigger than the office we're in now, but we're going to keep the office we're in now for admin and housing and move Peer House and our health services, including our clinic, Great. over to the new space. Great. So Great. it's yeah, and that's just, where the street medicine is operating out. Yes. So street right? medicine currently is operating out of our office now. But that'll be moved over, and then we'll actually be able to go out and hit the street. Um, we should be getting a vehicle for that, um, whether it's a small bus or a big van or something like that. We're, we'll have a vehicle um, probably within the next six months to be able to use for street medicine, and um, we'll take some of our outreach, our, our hygiene kits, and all that on the on the road. Great. So yeah, it's gonna be wow. It's gonna be really fun this summer. We have so many, and we have an open house planned for that office, and we have a band, and we're gonna have food, and um, so that's really exciting. Excellent. I'm not planning it, thank God, but yeah, right. I will pay for it. I will sign the checks. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's kind of our second um, space. And then the third, which is the one that really we're, we're working to tie up all the loose ends, and this is our major grant with the state, is the um, Veterans Housing Project in Gold Beach, which we just went up there and met with the state and city and some other folks and funders from around Southern Oregon. We went and met in Gold Beach and kind of took a walk around the project and talked about it. So that was fun last week. And then um, right now we're working with the city to get permits to finalize all of our permits. And we City should. of Gold Beach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to have all those in order to close escrow. So before we close escrow, we've got to have, I mean, there is probably, there was probably over 60 or 70 things that we had to have in place. Wow. Um, just to get this grant and get the approval. So Wasn't we're still- there a whole tank under Oh, there's a hot, yeah, tank? there's a hot tank under that. That was found by the environmental team. We're gonna have to mitigate that. Um, there's, but the, the motel itself is in great condition, but Good. there were a few surprises. Right. So- Right. Um, luckily, you know, the people that we have, we're working with have experience with this and have done it before. 
Good. Lots of times, so it's not something super uncommon. Every real estate deal has surprises. Uh, it's what I'm finding out. Everyone. <laughs> Less surprises if you get inspections done. Mm. And I'm going to mm-hmm. strongly encourage, as someone who has now reviewed many, many inspections, I'm. I, it's worth, I think we paid $750 for inspection at the office. And that saved us ten grand. Wow! So well worth it. Yeah. Um, and now we know what to, you know, what to use that ten grand on. What's priority? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So ins- inspections are are important. I think we used inspections unlimited. Going to put a plug for them. They were great. Good. Um, so so that's our third. We don't we don't have that one yet. That has not closed escrow, but, but we close pay closing escrow on April thirtieth. Okay. So we well, are. That's only two and a half yeah, weeks away. Um, Adam and I are. We still have a few things to get done. So <laughs> that's fine. We, we we need the time. Yeah. Um. But that'll be 19 units for veterans housing, and wow. we'll, we'll be working with you know VA. We'll be working with um, probably a lot DHS, a lot of different agencies on the housing wonderful. authority. We're wow. looking at getting vouchers for most of the units, so they're already low income, although. What we noticed was low income is still not very affordable. You're kidding. Yeah, there's, um, you know, low income for a one bedroom, if you have it at kind of the 80% AMI, which is the area median income. So if you're looking at area median income and you were calculating rent, I think a one bedroom is still somewhere around $1,100. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's affordable housing. So imagine... Affordable for somebody. Yeah, imagine workforce housing. It's going to be much more. It's going to be... closer to double that. Wow. Um, yeah. That makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Cause, because um, kind of workforce housing is that 80% to 200% AMI level. Mm-hmm. And so you figure it's probably going to be about double or at least 150% of low income. So I mean, who can afford that? That's Yeah. So crazy. that's why we also applied for federal funding, which is the HUD vouchers. So most people know these as Section 8. Mm-hmm. Um, we applied for HUD vouchers. And it'll be project-based vouchers. So the way that project-based vouchers work, um, which is much different than the individual housing choice vouchers, is housing choice vouchers you apply for as an individual person. You wait. You're on a wait list, and once it comes up, you 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 know go through all the steps and you get your voucher, and then you find housing and you apply the voucher. So it's kind of a process. With uh with these project-based vouchers, that this all comes through the Arcus Curry Housing Authority. And I've been working with Matt Borderstrass on that. He's been great. I really, very much appreciate him. He's their new director. Um, but these vouchers are attached to the units, so nobody has to apply. Mm-hmm. When they get into that unit, they pay a 30% of their rent. If they're, if, or I'm sorry, they pay 30% of their income to rent. Wow. So if they make $300, they pay $100. Wow. Yeah. So And, and then with that voucher, the federal government pays the rest. HUD pays the rest. So if the rent is... 1100 they only pay 100 HUD pays 1000 wow. So we get our full income, but they are able to um, have it maximize the affordability for them. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, and it was probably years ago, um, but, I, but I remember that the rule of thumb was that you weren't supposed to spend any more than 25% of your monthly yeah. income on housing. That was the role, rule of thumb. I think, we're, I, I think we're at somewhere around 67% of Curry County residents pay more than 50% of their income. So a lot of statistics there. But essentially, you know, what do we have? A lot of people yeah. paying a lot of money. Yeah. For their it's, it's quite a bit. Um, yeah. In fact, I think it was... Somewhere even close to thirty-five percent, or maybe it was closer to forty percent, that pay more than seventy-five percent of their income oh. to rent. And a lot of landlords they like to see you making three times, but mm-hmm. once you get in, your your rent, you know, your income changes sometimes. People mm-hmm. lose income, mm-hmm. and so while they they certainly had that income to get into the space, and they can still afford their housing, that's all they can afford, right? So that's that's that edge that people are living on that we talk about, and it's rough. Oh, it's I mean, very. It, yeah. it's rough. I've been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've been homeless too, but I've I've definitely been there. So, and if if what you are doing is trying to decide whether you're going to pay your rent or get your medicine, mm-hmm. that's a bad place to be. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's so many things that people give up 
yep. to pay their rent. Yep. Um, so, so that's, yeah, so we're hoping that the that project gets wrapped up by the end of the month and we can start opening some units within a few months, we think. And it will specifically be for veterans. Veterans, mm-hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, which Curry County has the highest um, population of, but you know, per capita of mm-hmm. uh, veterans, and that is certainly reflective in our population that lives out on the street. Yep. So we're really... And there's high suicide rate. There is, yeah. Curry County also has some of the highest suicide rates in right. the state and, again, reflective in the veteran population. Yeah. So. And I think it will make a tremendous difference. I, I know that, you know, there are people who say housing first mm-hmm. and that it automatically eliminates so many problems. So oh, we've seen it firsthand. I mean... We see it all the time with our shelter, mm-hmm. with um, when we get people into other housing. Yeah, we see it a lot around here. H- housing, getting people into housing mitigates so many other expenses and, and issues that they're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, the, yeah, those are, uh, there are a couple others that are, like I said, in the queue. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got another house we're looking at near near to the turnkey property that would be kind of ideal to have in collaboration with that property because we would be able to separate and have, you know, a house for men and a house for women and there's space for children and childcare and um, so many things. I mean, it's, it's just the the potential for for the property that we're looking at right now is, is endless for us. So, That's great. Um, and then there's a potential for a property in Gold Beach, and a second property in Gold Beach. Excellent. Just, I think... One of the units could be low-income housing and one could be medical respite. So, Mm. I mean, it's right there near the hospital. Mm -hmm. It just would be kind of ideal. So medical respite, for those who don't understand the term, is what? That's a short-term stay. It's not the same as a skilled nursing facility, which we call a SNF. Um, Skilled nursing facility, you still have, you need nursing care. Um, When you don't need nursing care anymore, and you don't qualify to stay in the hospital, you usually get discharged to home. And you may still have some some needs, and you may need to get a caregiver or a temporary caregiver or a family member to take care of you. And when people are without housing, they discharge to the street and they don't have someone to help take care of them. And so what would happen is they would end up back in the emergency room with uh, probably exacerbated symptoms. So what we're doing is we're trying to um, create a couple of beds so that, you know, people can have up to six weeks to heal and be back on their feet. You know, it's not medically appropriate for them to stay in the hospital. It's not it's not high enough acuity for them to go into skilled nursing. So there's this gap for yeah. folks who don't have housing that their, their um, return rate to the emergency room is much higher than general public. So what we're looking to do is create beds so that they can get there instead. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is there are people who find that objectionable, that you give them a, a free bed to recuperate, right, and, yeah. you know. But the reality is that if they end up back in the emergency room, it ends up costing us much more. Thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, and I, I, I wish I just off the top of my head, had, a, had the statistic for um, what the reduction in emergency room visits, um, kind of what the, what the cost of those emergency room visits is for mm-hmm. people who are without housing on average and how much we pay in the United States for um, essentially this kind of shelter care, because that's, that's a lot of times what it's used for by people who are without housing is right. shelter care. And I did myself when I was, when I was homeless. Mm-hmm. So... Um, yeah, I, I wish I had that stat right off the top of my head because it's a pretty significant amount of money. It's somewhere in the billions. Um, as a as a country, we spend somewhere in the billions on unnecessary emergency room. Now, not all of that obviously is homelessness or right. anything like that, but right. But um, still, and and a good chunk of that is administrative costs based on just general visits, you right. know, Entirely, right. but yeah, it's a lot of waste. Mm-hmm. And that I I think that's one of the things that that certainly I mean when I when I say you know that you raise the level of the water so that mm-hmm. all the boats are are yeah. coming up you know so that the the care that is being given to the people that I don't know some people think least deserve it mm-hmm. it really helps all of us I mean it 
Well, we, I mean, we saw it during COVID, what happens when there's surges in the hospitals and when there's no place to discharge people to. Yep. And we took a lot of the discharges from the hospital when it was people without housing who had COVID, when we had a full shelter for COVID um, patients. Right. The state paid for that motel, I think for 11 months they paid for that. It was quite a significant amount of time. Yeah. And now they could use it if they got the COVID shot and they had um, any kind of side effects, they could use it. They could stay in there if they were COVID positive. Right. And so we took some of those discharges from the hospital to free up space. And what uh, just the other day we were talking with the emergency room. He over uh, Andy oversees the emergency room for Brookings and for Gold Beach. And, you know, he was kind of talking about how one of the biggest challenges is we've got to get those beds empty in case there is a surge or in case there are people coming in. And sometimes when they have people who are without housing, they struggle with the discharge plan. Of course. And so, you know, we've we've facilitated quite a few discharges. We just recently facilitated one from Crescent City. Um, and this person is now getting into medical respite in Medford because we don't have one here yet. Right. So that would be something we would do here is we would facilitate the Which discharge be much to better. respite and yeah. we would provide wraparound case management. We would also provide um, primary care if they don't have that because we do have that on site. And um, pretty much anything else they need. I mean, we have everything from healthcare to housing to hygiene stuff. So it's once we get the showers up, we'll be a, you know, not a full stop. I really think that there are no full stops. You no, know, there's no, no, there's no one place that you can go for everything. But right. we'll have a lot more to supplement working with St. Timothy's and the food bank for sure. That's great. Yeah. That's excellent. You undoubtedly have some success stories, right? I mean, oh man, right? Yeah, yeah. They've been the actually staff have been collecting them, which is I'm so grateful for them. Like because I just I don't have the time to capture all that, and that you know they have the relationships with people. So, right. and it, which is really interesting because a couple of years ago I was still doing direct service, and now, I mean, sometimes they'll talk to me about someone I I I don't know who it is. So that's really that's really odd for me sometimes, but. Also really cool to see them in their journey with clients and this, watching them grow and get, and get these wins. You yeah. know? Um, and we don't own the wins. We don't own the losses, but it's really um, fulfilling for us to yeah, you be able to, to celebrate see that them. we're working. On, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're working stuff out with people. Uh. So, yeah, we do. I do have and I actually have some a couple of cards I brought from the shelter when um, people had discharged. They or when when people had left the shelter a couple weeks ago. Some of them had written me a thank you note. Oh, nice. I know it was. I was not expecting that. And I started reading the first one when I got home um, after I got them. And I just like I had to stop for a minute because it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, let's. I mean, I'd love to hear some of them. So, I, and of course, I'll keep this very confidential. I won't even say he or she or right. any of this. But um. so this is an individual that I think that the whole team really, really wanted to see come into the shelter. And um, and we don't judge success. We, you know, if if somebody's just in there for the whole length of the shelter and then they just discharge to the street, they got they still got so much out of it. Um, they still got a lot. And so uh, that's kind of what happened with this person. Uh, they said, thanks for everything your organization has done for all survivors forced to be homeless or houseless. There's not enough words to describe my gratefulness for everything you have done to support and inspire me to stay alive and also to feel safe during the winter of 23-24. Wow. That's one that I... I like, yeah. especially like that phrase, inspire me to stay alive. I know. Yeah. You know, We've... That's so important. There were a few people that I think were barely hanging in there. Mm -hmm. um, people who were very vulnerable mm -hmm. and we had a just a, I mean, record-setting rain uh, this winter. Oh, it was horrible. There was a lot of cold. Yeah. Uh, we have elderly on our street. I mean, they're older. I uh, think it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around that. Mm -hmm. People who, who don't come into contact with the individuals who kind yeah. of maybe see people in the distance. They see a lot of the ones walking around right. and out and about. But we have so many that are really um, either in wheelchairs or they they're, have a lot of mobility issues. Um, and so 
you know, we don't see everybody. And you don't see the ones that are, like, there are some who, just to stay out of trouble, go outside of city limits, and they can't get into the city on a regular basis. And right. so we get worried about them sometimes. Yeah. You know, we have someone who's in his 70s that um, regularly goes up into the woods to, to stay off of the radar, and then we don't hear from this person right. or see them for a few months, and we get very concerned because they are older, and they do have a lot of health issues. So... And you would have health issues. I mean, I'm absolutely, you know, I'm in my close to mid 70s at this point, and I've got health issues, and I have a roof over my head, and food yeah. to eat, and clothing to wear. I mean, and I've got health issues. Yeah. If I had to live on the street with the issues that I've got, or out in the forest, in the woods, on the, yeah. Um, I would not last very long. Yeah, it really does affect your overall health, um, especially. The inability to eat like healthy foods or prepared mm -hmm. prepare foods, you know, very well. So that's yeah, that is a big deal for a lot of the folks that we run into. Well, so I'm really glad that this person got yeah got I am the too. help. And I was so yeah. happy to read that letter. Yep, um, and just see how I I know how far they came just yep. in the few months that they were able yep. to be in there. It it makes a difference. Well, and that's really the only thing that we really that a lot of us care about is making a difference. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to make mm -hmm. a difference. That's that's why we live, to make a difference. Yeah, and we can't, you know, sometimes we get frustrated because we can't make the difference we want to, but yeah. then we see stuff like this. And yeah. and I think back to when I was homeless and I somebody got me a motel for a few weeks or something and just mm -hmm. how grateful I was just for that break and being yeah. able to get up and take a shower whenever yes. I want to. We, I never, never take my shower for granted, never. In 10 years since I've been housed, not once have I gotten in that shower and not thought, thank God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is the that and being able to prepare foods was what I missed the most. Yeah. I felt not human. Yep. Not having those things. And a bathroom, of course. Yes. Yes. Critical. Critical. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And how so, other people don't understand that. And here in Brookings, it's so hard to find restrooms. And in, in they're Jackson in. County, in, in, well, Josephine County, not so much, but Jackson County, there's a lot. There, you know, there's quite a few places you can go. And you can get a membership at the Y for $9 a month and have showers right. fairly often. Nice. There's a lot of stuff, but here, you know, we don't have that. So, uh, so this is another one. This is an individual that we weren't able to take into the shelter last year, and we almost weren't this year. And I think this person was struggling so hard that the moment we got an opening, we just brought this person in. Uh, so it says, Diana, thank you so very much for having it in your heart to do this kind of thing. Obviously, you understand that because a person is having enough problems uh, being homeless doesn't mean they have no worth. That's what your network does. Help us let um, help us let the human show. Mm. I tried to utilize the time I had here best um, of, to my own ability. I've gotten things done, but... Uh, that I de didn't even have the hope to think about. Once again, thank you. God bless you. And if I can in any way be in a, a position to do likewise, believe I will. So that, f for me, that that kind of gratitude that will transform into service if yes. that person gets the chance is exactly, it. that's, that's how yeah. raising the water helps exactly. all of us. It's, it is because somebody raised it for me and here I am. Yes. Impacting exactly. hundreds. So if each one of us did that, yes. it would you know, multiply exponentially. Yes. yes, absolutely. And and what I found because I you know, I did some, I helped somebody last year and and it didn't turn out great, okay? But what I find is that what it did for me yeah. is it improved my character. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to see where I was being blind or where I was being judgmental mm -hmm. or where I was being not compassionate and allowed me the space to change that and hopefully, you know, try to change somebody else's life. Whether the, whether that works or not is not yeah. my, that's not my business. Yeah. I mean, 
it's my business to give. We we say um, regularly, you know, we don't own the successes, we don't own the failures. Yeah, like we're just here to facilitate a a better, a, you know, a better to experience, a better water. human experience. Yeah, for people. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And it's so it's so important, and it's important for your own personal growth. I mean, I I am really grateful. Oh yeah, yeah. That I got that opportunity to grow. So grateful for all of these growing experiences for myself. I yeah, mean, I, I yeah. I feel yeah. very. Blessed. It's not fun sometimes. It's I mean, not. <laughs> you know, it's a little challenging. Yeah, there's <laughs> definitely times where we've called each other with yes, struggles. a little anxiety provoking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, you just, you keep going because what's the alternative? Yeah, I... You know, the alternative... I can't you, stop. No, and, and the alternative is you turn your back and pretend that you aren't related, that you're not both human beings, yeah. that, that that thing over there doesn't deserve mm -hmm. basic care. And getting, you know, what you were talking about with kind of how you had tried to step in. And I realize you think it, it didn't turn out well, although, you know, planting seeds is planting seeds. Yeah. Uh, for you and for other people, for sure. Um, but, you know, we uh, we do make a big impact in people when we connect with them in a, a human way. And it makes a big impact on us. And like I said, it, it plants seeds for all of us. Um, and it makes it human. So most of the judgment that I hear and see out in our community and in the world, it's vitriol towards the nameless, faceless people. Mm -hmm. So putting a face and a name to it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've heard people say like, you know, oh, the homeless, the homeless. So, but not that one. Like, that one's pretty cool. No, that's just because you know that one. Right. If you knew them all, you'd like most of them. Right. I mean, there are going to be personality differences, right? Per it's almost like, like it's like that with people in houses, too. Right, exactly. I don't, like, could you imagine if we grouped people in houses the way we grouped people who are homeless? Like, think of all the people <laughs> you have nothing in common with who live in housing, and suddenly you're part of that community. Right. Yeah, they're your, they're your buddies. Yeah, no. Might even ask you how they're doing today just because, well, you guys are both in houses, so I assumed you know. Oh, isn't that an interesting yeah. way to think about it? So we must all be the same. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of them don't even like each other out there. That's how it goes everywhere. Right. right. Um, but we, we just treat it like this faceless, nameless, homogenous group of people, right. and that's why we fail to understand. Right. Because they each have a different story. They each have their own story. Yeah how they ended up where they are right now, what will happen in the next and six some, months. Just, I mean, just some of the most amazing people. There's an individual there that does um, magic tricks, and I don't like magic only because... Really? Yes, because it trips me out, and I can't... They, they did the one where they throw the card at the window and it ended up on the other side, and I cannot figure out how... I, I still, I have no, I just had to walk away. I was like, nope. <laughs> well, you realize that that is your bug of the I just right? think that that's not possible. You have to possible. be able to understand it. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I have to yeah. be able to understand the, the mechanism of something. That's funny. I can't, I can't figure out. There are things you will not be able to figure out. It's just honey. the door was closed. So I'm just, <laughs> I just still don't understand. <laughs> Anyway, you have any other other stories or um, I you know? I have you know there's a few more cards but mm -hmm. but not quite as impactful but mm -hmm. I I I have one story that um, Steve brought up the other day of sort of like it's not we try not to say like success stories because gosh again we don't own the successes we have right. no idea what people consider their successes right but what I will say from a provider level was it was sort of a best case scenario. Like mm. this, if all of the cases went this way, just we, I mean, you know, there's there's always going to be people who are homeless because it's such a fluctuating um, issue. But it just, it was just such a good example of start to finish how we like things to go and, and how our team is operating. So essentially this this family came in um, there's a baby, there's a pregnancy, um, all of that. And 
they came in and I think they were really just kind of coming in to see what we do. And, you know, they heard that we might be able to help with um, some hygiene stuff. That's a lot of times how people come in. It's like, mm-hmm. well, I heard you can do, a, uh, you have clothes here or you have hygiene, right. or you have snacks. And then they talk with Kathleen and then Kathleen tries to schedule them with Laura for an intake for health programs. And so that's what happened. This person, we were able to get them and the whole family into, um, we got them set up with the walk-in services and then we we were able to get them into primary care. Wow. And then um, like our resource navigation to help with case management, mm-hmm. financial needs. And then we were able to get them into the housing program. Wow. And then um, the housing program was able to get them housing within a week, I want to say. And I'm shocked. They got into housing. They came back and, and, and kept engaging with the healthcare program and with resource navigation. And um, I think. Today or yesterday, I think it was yesterday, um, the one of the adults started work here in town. Wow. And so it was, they went from... I mean, that's really perfect. I mean, it just, it's just an example of how it could go, mm-hmm. you know, when you have everybody working together cohesively and you have all of the resources. It's it's like adding services is, is not... It's not opening a restaurant. It's just adding things to the menu. And I think that when there are enough things on the menu, people will pick what will serve them. Yes. And we love it when people pick all the services Mm -hmm. um, because that's really, we can fully wrap around them with everything we have. And so that was really a a great example of that. What an incredible difference. And I think they, again, I think they really thought that they were coming in to maybe get some hygiene stuff and figure out what we do. And they, you know, they, they walked out of there a week later with housing, healthcare, um, and a lot more security for sure. So they have a job. I mean, when you think about that in terms of the, you know, raising the water, that's a family that is no longer homeless. Yeah. That's a family that, you know, the, the, shopkeepers who are annoyed with the homeless Mm -hmm. will not see on the street anymore. This isn't this is a baby that's not on the street. Exactly. Uh, And and this is a family who actually, because they've got work now, might be able to buy some things, maybe even in that shop. Yeah. That the shop Exactly. Right? So it's it lifts all of us. It lifts us all. Yeah. And and I mean, everybody wants something different for their life, and everybody that walks into our building wants something different for our life. So not everybody's going to walk in and say, oh, I want health care, and I want housing, mm-hmm. and I want to get into all that. Right. Everybody's a, di- a different place. Right. And so while that is certainly a good example, I mean, the person that's been coming into our office for the last three and a half years, three years or so, um, that's still just coming in to get a cup of coffee and check in. That's still a win for us. Of course, because it makes that person's life better. And and we know that when they're ready to do anything, we know that they know who to talk to. Right. Um, and, and there's no pressure on right. anybody to be a certain way or meet a certain goal. So that's what we, that's that's, I really like that about my team. There's, I can't even like, can't plug them enough. Like they're right. a really good team. And, and they obviously like working there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Weird. I mean, I think you were talking the other day about, you know, you you don't have people leaving their jobs with you. No, and now that I say that, we should probably knock on wood. But yeah. I won't do that because then you'll have to edit it out. But um, yeah, we we uh, we get along really well. Mm. We talk a lot. There's a lot of mixed personalities, and as we grow, we we've, we've found some rubs, but we've also really just tried to work through those in a logical way in a way that makes sense and is respectful for everybody's space and i know that's you know it's kind of vague but it's sort of that's i think just the basic premise that we have with each other is um we're respecting each other Mm -hmm. and so when somebody's upset and if somebody's you know snapping or if somebody's struggling that day we all pitch in and that's what i've seen from this team is you know when i have someone who is just they have to be out um everybody pitches in mm. and I I will clean a toilet like it, there's no job that anybody in our organization will say like I'm not doing that right so I mean we have good boundaries so there are things we will not do but right. when it comes to all of the tasks and in, involved in that everybody works together so 
Yeah, and it's it's really important, you know, because the the work that the work that you guys do is stressful. Yeah, um, there is a there is a cost. There is, and we we actually just had a training on moral injury last week. That's where um, Andy from the emergency room and Jennifer, who is the McKinney Vento liaison with the school district, talk about moral came. injury a little bit. Yeah, moral injury. Because I know that we've we, talked about it before, but. It's something we talk about a lot um, in our organization because a moral injury is essentially our it, it's our moral compass, and it's it's like everything that we believe in is fighting with the experience that we're having right now and and what we're seeing or what we're doing or what we're not doing. So moral injury is sort of the belief that something I did or something I didn't do caused this pain for this person, and when you're in uh, service delivery, there's acts of omission and acts of commission. And so both of those can cause injury. You know, oftentimes in the work we do, it's acts of omission. It's we're not giving out a resource. We're not bringing someone into the shelter. We're, we're not doing something. In, in uh, certain jobs where it's a lot more, um, I guess it's, with, especially where there's criminality or where there's any kind of aggression, law enforcement is a good example there's probably examples like this in the hospitals and, and whatnot. Well, certainly physical harm mm-hmm. is uh, raises the stakes. So, you know, when we saw um, right at the height of COVID, there were hospitals where doc- emergency room doctors uh, spoke about turning someone away didn't mean they were turning them away in the moment. It meant that person was going to die. Yes. And they were making those decisions left and right. And they had to. Yep. And so the moral injury of that is, that's more of an act of omission. So I guess an act of commission would be law enforcement having to tackle someone or having to, you know, when they're very much a nonviolent person and they're hoping to, to resolve the situation without right. that, but then it escalates. Yep. And so moral injury is, I am, in the bigger picture, this is the right thing to do. But right here, right now, one-on-one, this doesn't feel good. Right. And that's moral injury. And we experience that constantly in the work we do. And, you know, my team definitely experiences that. We try really hard to um, communicate that to each other. Mm-hmm. And when we're struggling with that, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of one-on-ones, we have great staff meeting every Friday to talk about these things and talk about what we're struggling with and how we can problem solve together. We also take a lot of breaks. You know, not everybody takes all their lunches every time, but I really try to be on them about that. I try to encourage people to take weeks off and take time. And so that's just how we can kind of um, heal. But we also, like that training, we bring other agencies together to talk about how we're all feeling about it and how difficult it is and and validate it really for everybody, which doesn't seem like a lot. But then, you know, we kind of go back out there in the field and we, you know, sometimes being or not being alone it can cause more injury. You know, with COVID, it was hard because the whole world was going through this trauma. Right. And so it, it almost caused, it almost compounded the trauma because right. you know that no matter who you turn to, they're also dealing with it. Right. That's a that's a pretty difficult uh, reality when, and I've talked about this before, but when the help needs help. Yes. And the help isn't there. And the help isn't going to get any help. So, <laughs> you so know? that can cause significant yeah. moral injury yeah. when you aren't able to deal with it and process it. So we do a lot of processing for sure. Which is great. And a lot of going over the wins. We mm-hmm. do uh, wins every Friday. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes even I'm like, ah, gosh, I forgot we got to do wins today. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of tedious. But then we go around the room and everybody tries to contribute as best they can. And then we get done and we look at it. And, you know, one day it was like, Oh, we got hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants and got mm-hmm. a property and got 10 people into housing. And so we we go over those wins a lot. And one of the wins that, you know, I know we don't have time to go over a lot of it, but one of the wins that we just recently, Dave gave me the update for yesterday is this. So there's this 100-day challenge, which I can't go into the whole thing, but essentially the state paid a consultant group to come in and really work with any of the counties in Oregon that wanted to, um, there's funding that's coming down, or that did, and will continue, and it only can go to the local planning groups in each county. So Curry County didn't have a local planning group, so we formed a homeless task force, and the funding came to us, and we're working with the rest of the agencies to make sense of it. 
Um, and so then the state said, well, we have funding. We're bringing in consultants for any of the local planning groups that want to get some structure within their groups. Most of the counties already have quite a bit of structure around their groups. They've been going for years. So um, we, I was the first to raise my hand. So there's three counties right now going through it, and, and I think three more coming online. We're halfway through our challenge now. But essentially, all the agencies in Curry that, that work on homelessness and housing came together. It was a wonderful meeting. There were so many people there. And we came up with some goals. We came up with one main goal and some sub-goals. The main goal was to get 10 people, new people housed, um, and 50 new people engaged in case management. And 20% of both of those numbers had to come from the shelters. What ended up happening is, so instead of 10 people, we got 47 people housed. This is just since um, February, I think. Wow. Actually, it might even be um, sooner. I can't remember exactly when the challenge mm -hmm. started. So, um, and then instead of getting 50 people in case management, we got 75. Wow. So two of the people... Uh, that were supposed to be housed out of the 10 were from the shelter, and we got eight people from the shelter housed out of all 47. I mean, that's way above and beyond. Way above. Yeah, we've smashed that goal, and we're not wow. even done with the challenge. This Now, wow. this was a collaboration between us, St. Timothy's, Neighbor to Neighbor, the Food Bank. Excellent. Um, the co coalition, all of the, yeah, all of the main players, Talawa, um, trying to think of who else might. That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, that's wonderful. Because collaboration is the whole key anyway, right? I don't even know how. I mean, I truly, I don't know how Dave does it with getting people at housing. And St. Tim's, too. They they, yeah. we, they just find places yeah. to put people. So I love it. That's kind, love of it. A, that's kind of a major win for us as a county. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I would love the community to know about because I don't, you know, they don't even know this challenge is happening. No. And we're busting our ass to right. really get this done. Right. So... Well, we will talk about it the next time you come on. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, you know, do an update and, you know, talk about the wins again. Yeah, we'll have a new number by then. Although and, I told Dave, I think, I'm going to be expecting this, <laughs> this pace from you. I hope you know. So I expect another 47 in the next two months. And it's important to talk about the wins. Yeah. It really is. It is. Because it's it's a win for the entire community. Oh, it is. It so is. Yep. I, I I want everybody to know like yep. how much how how much better Curry County is doing yes. since last June. Yeah. When all of us started coming together to yeah. talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it benefits all of us. It really does. You know, every single one of us. I know. I know. Well, we've run out of time again, unbelievable as it may seem. Yeah, we didn't even get through the whole thing. I know. We never do. We never do. But, you know, we'll have you back and then we'll get through the I'll rest. be back. Yeah. <laughs> My guest today has been the delightful Diana Carter, Executive Director of Brookings Core Response. Really, thank you, Diana, for making the time to come on the show because yeah. I know how busy you are. I know, that's so, why I haven't been on in the last I month know. or so. So I'm really thrilled that you came on. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you enjoy our programming, support your community radio station. We're run entirely by volunteers and funded by donations. You can get more information about our station on our website, kciw.org. That's kciw.org. I'm Candace Michelle. And this is our community.